uh, start off with um, is the executive summary. Now, it's the executive summary actually for the research paper, which we've been commissioned to write, and we've very uh, much uh, close to the end of finishing that. You'll be glad to know, Kerry. Um, and so the executive summary is particularly important because Kerry emphasized to us that European Commission officials have a very short attention span. You'll get into trouble for that, um, but they can take it out. Um, so uh, the uh, presentation that then follows is going to be largely on the statistics and what they, what they tell us. But the executive summary boils it all down um, from the paper, which 15,000 words, so forgive us for being quite short on some of the things. I'm sure we can pick them up in the questions and answers. So taking it from the top, by 2009, Chinese FDI had come to uh, uh, flows, outward flows, had come to exceed those of uh, the leading outward investors, such as the European Kingdom, uh, the European, uh, United Kingdom. <laughs> confusing my European Union and United <laughs> Kingdom already. Um, in 2010, um, <laughs> actually, perhaps that's the answer. We should form a <laughs> European kingdom, I think, to challenge the middle kingdom. I think that's, I think you heard it here first, anyway. Um, 2010, as you can see, China had invested 45 billion uh, euros abroad. The nice thing about this presentation is everything's in euros, of course. Um, and Chinese uh, investments um, are, are in the European uh, Union are uh, very small. And uh, that's uh, we're going to find out exactly how small in a few minutes' time um, uh, when we look at the figures. And Dr. Wong also alluded to this. Uh, the, the member states um, that have a structured approach to, outward foreign, uh, to uh, inward foreign investment from China actually do best. They are the largest economies, it's true, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, but um, they actually have a very purposeful approach to attracting inward uh, Chinese investment. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure, in the questions and answers. Um, the relationship between um, the European Union and, uh, the, uh, uh, and the People's Republic of China is primarily a relationship between the member states of the European Union and the People's Republic of China uh, in terms of FDI, the commercial relationship, uh, because um, it's actually uh, very recently that the European Union has taken over competence for foreign direct investment uh, policy in the way that, of course, it's had competence for trade policy since the mid-1960s. Um, uh, with a, uh, appointing a commissioner from the Treaty of Rome, in fact. Um, so the movement there towards the competence at the, uni at the uh, level of the European Union is actually a, a, a really a turning point. So it's very timely that we should be looking at the issue of the uh, of Chinese investment in the European Union because it's possible for policy to be shaped now as opposed to uh, pre-Lisbon Treaty. It wasn't possible at the European Union level. The relationship is very interesting between member states and, and China. And what we find is that those countries which invest the most in China tend to be the ones that receive the most investment from China. And, um, uh, uh, and that suggests that it's these bilateral relationship uh, which is actually very important. So the more uh, that a member state and arguably the more the European Union contributes to the Chinese economy, the more likely is the familiarity will breed inward investment from China. And we can see some evidence of that. Now, um, since uh, the year 2000, uh, Ch Chinese investors have uh, diversified the range of industries uh, that they invest in the European Union. They started off uh, looking at high tech, uh, focusing on high technology, infrastructure, heavy industry. But now we're seeing diversification to the services industry um, and telecommunications, which of course is multinationalized within the European Union, precisely because of the liberalization that took place in the 1980s. Um, the relationship that we see apparently between market size uh, of the member state and inward investment from China um, is, I think, because the European Union single market is actually segmented to a large extent, or rather perceived as segmented by uh, Chinese investors. And this is a very important point, a very important point for Chinese investors. Um, they, when you, uh, a foreign investor in, invests in a market that it's not very familiar with, there are fixed costs of doing, uh, of doing business. And the larger the market, the more likely those costs can be spread. And that, uh, therefore, it means to say the larger market is more attractive, because once you've got paid those fixed costs, so you know how to operate in that market, you've got a large market that you've, all, uh, that you've uh, got activity in. So uh, we'll return to this in a, uh, 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 on the policy front. 
Chinese firms uh, tend to um, have a lot of acquisition act activity. Mergers and acquisition data show that the mergers and acquisitions take place in the same countries that uh, most of the foreign direct investment takes place in. Um, and what Chinese firms are looking for with uh, mergers and acquisitions, it's really mainly uh, acquisitions, of course. Uh, we just are uh, saddled with the term M&As as a legacy, um, is the, uh, si uh, is the uh, size of the economy and the degree of liberalization. So it's, if it's easy to take over enterprises, then Chinese foreign direct investment uh, will Will very often go down the route of acquisition. The opportunity to acquire strategic assets is very important for Chinese firms, in particular acquiring networks uh, of multinational firms. So not just acquiring a business in, in a member state of the European Union, but actually uh, acquiring a network of that multinational enterprise, not only within the European Union, but also internationally, immediately internationalizes the Chinese firm and gives it um, a, a far greater degree of diversification than it could have obtained on its own. Um, also, of course, getting technology, acquiring technology through acquisition and brands, very important. Now, the investment promotion uh, agencies in the member states perform a very important uh, in, uh, facilitation function for inward foreign direct investment. They reduce information and transaction costs of Chinese investors. And uh, they, uh, the fact that uh, they, uh, they do this um, it shows that it's this, in a sense, we think, of, we think of it as being the costs of entering a market. Now, if you can neutralize those costs of entering the market or bring them down, it makes foreign investment more likely. We've also seen a tendency uh, for the proliferation of um, investment promotion agencies. Each country, each member, member state in the European Union has at least one investment promotion agency. I say at least one, some have several. Some have them by region. Now, this proliferation of region and the even city-level investment promotion agencies testifies to how important um, this reduction of the barriers is perceived to be and the degree of uh, commitment of financial resources to try to encourage inward investment, in particular from China. Um, an integrated FDI policy at the European Union level, um, we think um, encompassing international investment agreement with China um, would be uh, a, a big step forward. Uh, a significant amount of uh, Chinese um, difficulty in entering the European market is this cost of foreignness, the fact that they don't know how to do business, not only in the member state they might be locating their investment in, but also the rest of the European Union. Now, that would, uh, the, the, the fact that there are these costs of foreigners mean to say that although there's no discrimination against Chinese firms, if nothing is done to help address their concerns and the, the information that they need, then in fact it's a sort of discrimination by not doing anything or not doing enough. And so this is really quite important that the European Union, although it's got very little inward Chinese investment, it actually hasn't uh, as, a, as a whole made a great effort. Um, and uh, our, our, our policies uh, based on the reduction of barriers at the European level would be very helpful, um, and they would help um, much more, we think, than encouraging investment incentives, which actually are a, a very weak attempt to try to get inward foreign direct investment. Far better to reduce the barriers to doing business, and that's good for domestic industry, European industry, as well as for inward Chinese investment. Now, one of the things we're going to emphasize towards the end of our talk today is the quality of inward Chinese uh, investment, not just the quantity. Looking at the numbers is okay, but it doesn't tell us anything about the impact. And this is very important. Um, and what we really are uh, going to sort of hinge our analysis on is the German benchmark model. Nothing to do with the fact that Hinrich is German and sitting next to me here. Um, uh, but he did insist I put it in. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that high value added, high labor productivity, and high employment. That's what we see when we look at Chinese investment in Germany and indeed our, or most of foreign investment in Germany. And that's really, in a sense, a holy grail, if there's a holy grail of inward foreign direct investment. Now, Chinese firms are unlikely to transfer new technology to the, uh, to, to the European Union, but uh, uh, certainly the advanced countries. But what they are likely to transfer is entrepreneurship, an entrepreneurial business model. They do have the potential to re-energize parts of the economy uh, that need re-energizing. And so uh, with that in mind, I think it's fair to say that inward Chinese foreign direct investment is likely to be a good thing. Now, a little a note on how we measure, uh, how, we, how we look at um, 
uh, I don't know if we moved it on. No, you didn't move it on, but it doesn't matter. There we are. That was the executive summary, too, that you had. Um, the international, internationalizing firm. How we, um, how, how we uh, think of internationalization, how we measure it, is actually quite important. Um, the measuring foreign direct investment is very often using FDI, foreign direct investment, as a capital value. Now, FDI is defined as uh, an enterprise by a, 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 an enterprise by a foreign re uh, investment in an enterprise by a foreign resident enterprise with over the 10% or uh, 10% or over of equity-based voting power. So it's basically the idea is if you have 10% or more of voting power in a in an affiliate firm, then you can appoint a board uh, uh, on the board of direct, uh, directors uh, one director. So you get one director basically, and that signifies a long-lasting uh, management interest in the company. So that's how we measure, uh, how we indicate foreign direct investment exists. But it's measured in financial terms. And the problem with measuring it in capital terms is that it doesn't give us really an idea of the impact. What we really need is operational data, employment, uh, uh, value added, of course, turnover, profitability, and so on. And so when we look at, in, in, uh, at the impact of foreign direct investment, we really need these figures. And if this is a plea to the uh, European Union, it is to improve the figures, the improve the data that we collect, because as you will see, there's quite a lot of gaps. In a sense, the, the, uh, the, the, the countries which have uh, the poorest statistics tend to bring the European Union down, because the Euro Eurostat is very much reliant on each member state to provide statistics, and, and, and we haven't got the best statistics from every member state. So the motives for foreign direct investment, market seeking, that's very much like exports, trying to grow your market, so you might in engage in foreign direct investment to grow your market. Um, strategic asset seeking, I've already referred to, um, getting technology, networks, brand names, and so on. Efficiency seeking, we don't expect that to be very important in the European Union because there aren't a lot of uh, low wage uh, cost advantages for Chinese investors. And natural resources seeking, there are some evidence of that, but not, again, very much in the European Union. Acquisition uh, versus uh, uh, greenfield uh, foreign direct investment is the important distinction between the method of entry the mode of entry. So uh, acquisition means a lot of expenditure up front, um, and uh, obviously access to capital is very important for that, but at the time uh, uh, the acquisition take, takes place, a lot of money has to be put in right at the beginning. In Greenfield, it can be built up over time. And we would expect acquisition to be, do, to, uh, be related to acquiring assets which are already there in Europe, whereas Greenfield is using the strategic assets that the Chinese firm uh, itself has and is growing uh, slowly through its internationalization process. So with those uh, concepts in mind, I hand over now to Henrik. Thanks. Well, I, I would like to start with putting Chinese investments into the European Union into context. Because as we heard earlier, Chinese firms invest 50% more in the European Union than in America in 2009. But even this figure is tiny when you compare it to Chinese investment elsewhere in the world. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it from the background, all this kind of figures and graphics coming up here. But Chinese investments in the European Union is, is tiny in comparison to Chinese investments in Asia, Chinese investments uh, in Latin America. The problem with those data, of course, investments in Africa, uh, in Latin America and Asia, is that a lot of this investment is going to offshore financial centers like the Cayman Islands, British Virgin Islands, um, Hong Kong. And we don't know really where the money is going on from there. So what we can expect, though, that some of the investment is going through the Cayman Islands, through the British Virgin Islands, to the European Union. Um, and the data as presented here, which is coming from the Chinese sources, could be regarded as conservative. But even if you put it as conservative, it is a very small amount of Chinese investments going to the European Union. Um, and that's very much, if you like, from a Chinese perspective. If you look from the European Union, side. We see that lots, majority of Chinese investments is concentrated in the um, EU 15 in the old member states. So it's not as much going to the periphery um, as was alluded to earlier. It's very much going to the EU, UK, to Germany, to France, um, to those countries which also put most effort into attracting Chinese, and Chinese companies. But in terms of percentage of how much investment from outside the European Union is coming into the European Union is, is Chinese, 
it's less than 1% of all investment which is coming to the European Union is, is Chinese. So there's nothing, if you like, as the media is very much of, very often putting it as, as the Chinese are coming, the Chinese are buying out the European Union, the Chinese are conquering the European Union market, it is very much at this stage of an amount you could argue, well, we don't really have to discuss Chinese investments because there's hardly anything happening. But when you look at growth rates of Chinese investments into the European Union, you see that the growth rate is, is larger than it is for other regions in the world. And when you then consider that all of these figures are conservative because we don't know what's happening in offshore financial centers, um, there is some argument for looking further into Chinese investments um, and seeing how this could be attracted or also to see the impact of Chinese investments in European host economies. The distribution of Chinese investments within the EU27 has been very much concentrated on on services. And the services, we broadly mean the aspect like wholesale, distribution, transportation, logistics. So all of those activities which help Chinese businesses um, further exporting to the European Union um, and defending their market activities they already have in the European Union. Aspects which, which Jeremy Clegg mentioned as, as kind of market-seeking activities by Chinese firms. In this category also fall activities by Chinese banks, and very often you see kind of domestic banks going along with local MEs to support the internationalization process. So these two aspects of wholesale logistics, distribution and, and finance would indicate that there is a further increase of Chinese investments coming, partly because they've got better financial support by domestic banks they, they are familiar with. But also very often then exporting is preceding further investments. Once these Chinese firms are more familiar with the local markets, um, the kind of level of foreignness has been reduced and they made further contacts with local businesses. Um, and then we would potentially see shift as we see slightly happening over the year 2006 to 2008 of more investments in new manufacturing because Chinese firms see either that trade barriers might be erected in the European Union because of too much trade coming from China, or because they're becoming more familiar with the Chinese, with the European markets and therefore start investing in some European countries. And those investments in manufacturing could very likely be in those periphery countries, especially the Eastern European countries, where labor is somewhat cheaper than some of the Western countries. It has been mentioned a couple of times, in, at least in, in the public press, um, that the Chinese are coming, the Chinese are buying up the European Union. And there have been articles kind of nicely marketed with shopping bags, Chinese shopping bags, and the Chinese buying up the whole country. I think Forbes had a nice picture on this. But when you look at the acquisitions of European firms by Chinese, as reported at least by Thomson Reuters, they have been at maximum 17 acquisitions of European firms in any one year over the last 10 years. And acquiring 17 European firms across EU27 can't be called a buyout of European businesses. Um, the distribution of industries is though interesting because you've got a concentration in sectors which are labelled as materials, industrials, um, and high technology, all of the aspects, as, uh, which Jeremy called earlier, um, asset seeking, strategic asset seeking investments. And those kind of acquisitions should help Chinese businesses to move up the value chain to become potentially more competitive within the European Union, as well as um, back home in China, where there's stronger competition from Western and Asian businesses entering the Chinese market. Um, but also then, as, as one of the difficulties is Chinese companies face, that they have to pay lots and lots of license fees, say, to Western businesses which have made innovations and, and have patents. Once they start moving up value chains, 
they can create their own innovations, they can create their own patterns and reverse this kind of license flows, which could make them internationally very more competitive. A difficult part, of course, is with any merchant acquisition or any acquisition is the integration of businesses and as well as picking the right um, acquisition target. You will be familiar with the acquisition of Thompson's TV business by TCL, where they bought kind of completely outdated brands, completely outdated technologies. At a time when we moved to flat screen TVs, they had still bought the old technologies. Thinking it would work, would work well, and shortly afterwards had to close down the European businesses and operations in Poland and elsewhere because it was a huge failure. Um, other businesses like Lenovo have done better with the acquisition of IBM. And if they were to succeed in buying HP's business as well, it might be a quite a big force. In terms of distribution in, in countries, where do Chinese firms acquire European businesses? We see the same pattern again, that there's a strong concentration in the UK, Germany, and France. Ireland is popping up in 2010, which could be due to the economic crisis aspects and kind of opportunistic acquisitions by Chinese businesses. But again, it is not supporting the perception that there might be kind of coming in through the periphery and, and exploiting certain markets there. It's rather, especially the case in Germany, um, where Chinese businesses are acquiring smaller firms, acquiring family businesses which struggle with the um, succession to their um, children or elsewhere, who are just seeking an investor who has funding. And Chinese businesses where we often have funding um, at the hands where they can invest in this new business. And then, as the evidence shows, at least for the German case, a find win-win situation because the Chinese partner brings in new funding. The German side has then more opportunities to develop new products and is focusing on the R&D aspect. But also, for, for the cases we know of, there have been then Chinese firms which normally operated in the low-tech area, but the German partner could operate in the high-tech areas. Coming together then, you then are able to serve the whole market from low tech to high tech and potentially develop jointly some kind of mid technologies as well. At the same time, the German company gets better access to the Chinese market, which is in those particular sectors where we often the fastest growing sector globally. So in all respects, it's a win-win situation and German operations are normally not scaled down or closed down, it has been the kind of widespread angst when the Chinese are coming just buying, a, buying stocks and moving property elsewhere. Um, a note on the ownership type of Chinese businesses. Um, Chinese businesses, they, they, there is a great dominance or still a big role played by state-owned enterprises. And state-owned enterprises are active in buying European businesses. Um, and they indicated here as, as blue, as government-related or government-influenced businesses. But likewise, we see a large number of acquisitions by private enterprises, um, as you have a huge number of very wealthy and very rich Chinese entrepreneurs, which goes against a bit of what we said earlier about the kind of China's huge extremely poor um, some cities in China apparently have a higher ratio of Rolls Royce than you have in the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and Bentley is making great sales in China as well. So it's not, it can't be that poor a country. And you've got entrepreneurs coming from China to open industrial parks within the European Union to further support exporting and investment by Chinese businesses. Those parks are not necessarily well run. But there is indication of Chinese businesses coming to European Union for multiple purposes. Another point to be mentioned, which is a finding we have from another study we do parallel to this, it seems that it's not important very much if you are a Chinese private enterprise or Chinese state or state influenced business in order to internationalize. It's rather the question to what extent you have access to finance in China. And this then is a question to what extent you've got connections to the right sources of finance. And it 
it's very likely that you're a large private enterprise and you've got better access to finance than a state-owned enterprise, which might be small or might be struggling, or might be from a province where you don't have the economic development and institutions in place that can support the internationalization. In, in, this, in, in a nutshell, kind of this ownership question, therefore, mm -hmm. and which is very often related in, in Western countries, more so in the States, I suppose, with some kind of angst against government involvement, government relationships coming in, we, we wouldn't see this to the same extent. And if you're concerned about subsidies, if you're concerned about kind of unfair competition because of easy access to capital, then you would also have to look beyond state-owned enterprises and also consider private enterprises and very much look into detail how they have access to capital rather than just take it as a, as a given in, because it has to be state-owned, they are the only ones with access to capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now switching back to um, a, a study which uh, we didn't do. It's the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, which is uh, worked with o MOFCOM. Uh, so it's a Chinese uh, trade, promotion, trade and investment promotion body. Um, they do have been doing a, a, an annual survey in recent years, and um, which uh, I think will find rewarding to look at. Um, the purpose of Chinese investments, according to their survey, um, are quite revealing. Uh, but unfortunately, not according to the categories of investment motivation which I outlined earlier. Um, they've got their own. In fact, you'll particularly enjoy, I think, the one at the bottom, which is ev ev evasion of trade barriers. Uh, so that's a, uh, it, it's a very interesting the way in which the, the, uh, the survey is conceptualized. The key thing to take away from this is that strategic asset seeking, at least in part, is reported as being 49% um, of, of, of the purpose. So if you add acquisition of advanced technologies and experience to acquisition of famous international brands, uh, we can see that of the acquisitions which take place, um, a lot of them are actually trying to get hold of this sort of important um, investment uh, assets. The purpose of, uh, a purpose of Chinese investments, uh, particularly in the European Union 27, is exactly the same amount in terms of strategic asset seeking. So the first was the global picture. The second, uh, the EU 27, again, 49%. Acqu acquisition of well-known brands and also uh, acquiring advanced technologies and management expertise. So we can see that certainly the motive to acquire st strategic assets looms very large in the mindset of of Chinese firms. Having said that, the CCPIT survey is a small, a relatively small survey of firms and biased towards perhaps the small and medium-sized enterprises, which tend to be its major clients. So, um, in a sense, we're looking at a, a sort of a, a small part of the Chinese outward investment cohort. And then, thank you, Henrik, if we could move on to the most, the, the, uh, the, the respondents to this survey the most promising EU sectors, um, manufacturing, which of course covers a multitude of sins, and wholesale and retail trade, that is more or less to do with trade, trade promotion. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that what we need is a lot more detailed data in order to be able to drill down. But as you can see, um, the, uh, uh, the other sectors uh, uh, do, loom, uh, do uh, reveal themselves to be somewhat important, but nowhere near as important as manufacturing and, and distribution. So uh, with that, I think we can say that there's plenty more that we really need to know about what's going on within the mindset of Chinese internationalizing firms. And uh, with that, I'm now going to hand back over to Henrik, who's going to talk about the impact of Chinese firms uh, in the European Union. Well, we're going to finish off with the impact of Chinese investment in the European Union, um, not with a forecast of how much investment there's going to come, um, but rather to see how Chinese firms so far have impacted European Union economies. Because that's, in the end, the interesting part. Because if... Why, why would you want to attract more Chinese investments if you don't know really what the impact is, how they're connecting to local businesses, how they're helping local employment? And the data we have from this is from Eurostat, and I'm afraid you really can't see this probably with a small font size in the background, but there's also not a lot of data on this because Eurostat's data collection on this is pretty poor. 
Um, and as Kay wanted earlier, we should make policy, um, policy should be informed by good knowledge and data. But the data Eurostat is publishing is not good. So therefore, the kind of policy making European Commission could do on those data is questionable. Because when you look, for example, at the United Kingdom, and Eurostat is reporting there are 25 few Chinese businesses in the United Kingdom um, by 2006, while well, UK trade and investment is reporting some 400 businesses. So it's quite a difference in numbers these different institutions are reporting. Um, and the same goes for other countries as well. Some of the member states do not report any, any data on Chinese businesses. But to be fair, they're also not reporting any data on Japanese or American businesses. They are just not reporting any further detail, um, which could give some indication of how important are these businesses. Do we want, maybe, just attract more South Korean businesses because they bring more employment, they bring more investment and more knowledge to the country than Chinese businesses? Um, and especially given in times where we see budget cuts all over European unions, and you have to invest in the resources more carefully, you have to know really what the impact could be of, of any potential foreign investor. Jeremy alluded to the Chinese investments in Germany. Um, Germany and UK, as, said, as we said earlier, are the countries in the European Union which have been most successful in attracting Chinese businesses. And these countries also have investment promotion agencies with a very targeted approach normally, trying to identify Chinese investors they would like to have in their countries to invest in, or from particular industries, and then go visit them in their headquarters in China, speak to them directly, make a nice package for them to come over to invest here, um, rather than having a broad brush approach just going to trade fairs and sporty, speaking to everybody. But being very, very focused in terms of who they would like to have. And maybe this explains why certain indicators like turnover um, over value added as, as a ratio for Chinese businesses in Germany is very similar to the kind of data we see for American businesses. Um, and, and the same goes for other key indicators. We, even though Chinese investments is very small in size, um, and which is fair enough as Chinese, invest, Chinese businesses just started to internationalize and Japanese and Americans have been around for a couple of decades, for some key indicators we see that the Chinese are very productive very beneficial to the local economies. And with the example I brought early on the acquisitions and, and, and the win-win situation of Chinese firms, um, it's, it's very likely that they're also bringing good at fresh linkages to European economies in order for those businesses then to internationalize into China. And indeed, some of the investment promotion agencies we've been speaking to see this <coughs> as one of the great advantages of Chinese businesses coming into the European Union because this will eventually then kick off a exports from the European Union into China, or indeed for investments into China by European businesses, because small, medium-sized enterprises then suddenly see a chance to get to know Chinese businesses, to get to know Chinese entrepreneurs, and invest in the other direction. In, in note on the kind of technology and knowledge, Jeremy Clegg, Chinese Jeremy Clegg mentioned Chinese business being into the European Union. A recent trend seems to be, as indicated by the interviews with investment promotion agencies, that more and more Chinese businesses bring in R&D centers in the European Union. And with this, bring high-skilled Chinese labor. Not in the kind of scale as you would have heard of probably from Africa, where they've got thousands of Chinese workers come in and not, nobody else can work there. But more kind of in selective basis, you have some high-skilled Chinese laborers who then work with local businesses and local employees to jointly develop new ideas and products. And if we see this increasing in numbers, then some of these ratios and indicators of the impact Chinese businesses can have in local economies is going to improve um, further. But all of this, as we said, is on a small scale. To, to kind of summarize and then finalize this presentation. We 
we have some data on China's investment in the European Union, and, and the indicators indicate that the investment is increasing. The, the, which is welcomed by the European Commission as well as by the Chinese side. And indeed, the Chinese embassies we contacted is extremely welcome that, as I put it, finally, the European Commission is interested in Chinese investments because they would like to see further increases as well of Chinese investors. But the pattern of Chinese investments is, in the periphery, very sketchy. Data is difficult to get by. Um, a problem which investment promotion agencies see as well, because then therefore for them it's difficult to make any policies. But those investment promotion agencies with a very targeted and, and what we call a deep strategy on focused Chinese investments are the most successful in attracting Chinese investments and also an investment which has, it seems, a positive impact on the host economies. And it's not just an investment which is kind of asset stripping and moving back to China in a short instance. We are not going to make any predictions on the future of Chinese investments in terms of numbers. So there's no forecast from us yet to revise in the short future. Um, but it seems in all likelihood that Chinese investment is going to increase with the economic development we see in China um, and the increasing competitiveness of Chinese businesses. And with this, I would like to end the open dialogue on this further. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.